last week. Okay, Council, I would like to begin the uh, report on the medical marijuana related businesses. Um, we may need a lunch break uh, in the middle of this, uh, or we may not, depending on how straightforward uh, the discussion is. So I'm, I'm sensing a lunch break coming on, but let's, let's at least, we'll have our staff report and, and ask some questions if we could. Welcome, Mr. Coates, Ms. Craig, if you could introduce yourselves to members of the public, that would be great. Good morning, Mayor Helps, members of Council. Chris Coates, I'm the City Clerk, and with me is Shannon Craig, our, a Policy Analyst from Legislative Services. And we're here to present Council uh, a further report on proposed regulations for medical marijuana-related businesses. Uh, this is the, uh, the third time uh, for, for this issue before Council. And so this, uh, in part, is to inform you of the second round of, of public engagement that took place earlier this year. Uh, as background, uh, Council's aware that significant increases in, in these types of businesses has occurred since 2014. Uh, there's now approximately 35 businesses operating within the city, 32 of which are storefront retailers of medical marijuana. Uh, some of these businesses uh, are and have been having some impacts in the community that have created some concerns for both the public, the city, as well as Victoria Police. Um, the federal government has recently announced that they will be introducing legislation in the spring of 2017 to legalize marijuana. Uh, changes to the federal uh, regime is expected by the end, uh, the medical marijuana regime, sorry, is expected by the end of August this year. Um, in May of 2015, uh, going back quite a ways, Council gave initial direction to consult uh, with the public and, the, and related businesses uh, to bring forward some issues for Council's consideration about uh, proposed bylaw amendments aimed at mitigating impacts in the community, as well as uh, concerns associated with the ongoing operation of these types of businesses. Uh, as well, a proposed education and enforcement strategy was directed. The phase one consultation um, collected some feedback and the surveys indicated some strong support for a regulatory scheme, uh, including things such as age restrictions, security measures, signage, advertising restrictions, odor control and that sort of thing, as well as the number and location of businesses in the city. Uh, this also encompassed a best practices review and uh, proposed regulations were presented initially to council in November of last year. At that time, Council gave staff direction to communicate those regulations and invite feedback online and at an engagement event. Um, so that was the second phase of the consultation and the focus there was to collect feedback from the broader community on the proposed regulations. There were over 1,400 online surveys completed and approximately 250 or more attendees at an open house town hall meeting uh, in Council Chambers in February. Um, generally speaking, the engagement participants were supportive of the proposed regulatory approach. Um, and at this point, we're going to, uh, I'm going to turn this over to, to Ms. Craig, and she's going to just sort of highlight for council and the public the, uh, the proposed regulatory scheme that's being uh, brought forward for council's consideration. Um, I would note that uh, this presentation, part of the presentation will be quite brief. Uh, the, the staff report on Council's agenda goes into uh, uh, strong detail about uh, specific regulations and some analysis about all of those. So I'll, I'll let Ms. Craig uh, move forward with the, uh, the regulations that staff are proposing for Council to consider. Thank you. So uh, I'd first just like to highlight a couple of the uh, regulations that were in the initial proposal to Council and that you'll see from the report we are no longer recommending. So I just wanted to go through those two and give a little bit more detail about those. Uh, the first uh, 
one that I want to discuss is about edible products. So we know a lot of these businesses are selling products, uh, food products that contain marijuana. There's some concerns associated with that sale. Certainly the primary concerns are that consumers will overestimate the required dosage um, or that others will accidentally ingest the products. Sometimes the uh, packaging and labeling of these products is, is lacking. Um, there's also a secondary concern associated with food safety. Um, as we heard uh, both in the first uh, round of consultation and from a, a further letter that's on the agenda, certainly um, Island Health um, and the Chief Medical Health Officer would support a ban on the sale of edibles. Um, but we certainly heard uh, through public feedback in the second phase of engagement uh, that many individuals experienced a lot of benefits from the use of products and were opposed to a ban on the sale of edible products. I believe in terms of the survey, 74% uh, of our participants were opposed, and we certainly heard that same opposition from many speakers at the town, at the town hall. Um, we don't have a lot of authority, uh, the city, to implement many of the measures that would address the health and safety concerns associated with edible products. We are recommending um, that health and safety warning signs be posted, and we feel that that may mitigate some of the concerns. But certainly based on the in, uh, feedback we received during the engagement, we are no longer proposing a restriction on the sale of edible products. Uh, the next uh, regulation that I want to highlight is the uh, the one that was uh, with respect to mail and delivery. Um, so we had some concerns that retailers do lose their ability to screen customers and prevent uh, purchases by minors if sales are conducted other than an in-person basis via mail or some other form of delivery. Again, uh, we clearly heard from survey respondents and town hall speakers uh, that there are uh, benefits associated with mail and delivery of product, uh, especially for those that are unable to attend at a storefront realer, retailer. So based on the feedback that we received on that issue, um, again, we are no longer proposing a prohibition against the mail or delivery of products. I wanted to touch briefly on what we're proposing in terms of the zoning regulations because I know um, that's one of the regulations that will have you know, a significant impact on our retailers and it's probably one that you have some, some questions about. So certainly uh, storefront retailers aren't currently a defined use under our zoning regulation bylaw uh, because the sale of marijuana at storefronts is illegal under federal laws. So again, in keeping with feedback uh, that we heard from a majority of engagement participants, we are recommending an amendment to the zoning regulation bylaw that would prohibit storefront retailers in any zone of the city unless expressly permitted. What would accompany that uh, amendment to the zoning regulation bylaw would be a rezoning policy that would help guide council decisions on rezoning applications. We've attached a proposed rezoning policy uh, to the report, and what it indicates is that storefront retailers should be at least 200 meters from schools and also from other retailers. As I mentioned in the introduction to this regulation, we do have a number of businesses um, that will be impacted because they are clearly within 200 meters of one another. Our preliminary, preliminary analysis of locations seems to show that nobody is too close to a school. Um, in terms of the process for managing these rezoning applications, if council wanted to go in this direction, we're recommending that our typical city rezoning process uh, would be applied. Um, that would mean there would be community meetings um, hosted by the appropriate community association land use committee on every application and a public hearing before council on each application. Um, as you can imagine, this would have some impacts on staff in the development services um, division to uh, process um, an expected influx of these applications. Um, what we're recommending in the report is that if council wants to go in this direction, we would certainly report back with more details about those resourcing impacts. I'll just quickly run through the remainder of the regulations. Um, most of the, uh, the remaining regulations that we're recommending were things that uh, we were uh, proposing in our initial plan. So um, a restriction on opening hours, so uh, recommending that storefront retailers aren't open for business between 8 p.m. and 7 a.m. 
Um, we're also recommending that uh, the premises of a retailer can only be used for the sale of medical marijuana and accessory uses. Um, our intention here isn't to restrict related activities. If you're selling marijuana, you can sell paraphernalia. You can provide advice about the use of marijuana. Um, we're saying unrelated types of activities would be prohibited, such as cafes, that sort of thing. Um, also a recommendation uh, that businesses can't advertise or promote the use of marijuana to a minor. And as I mentioned earlier, um, a requirement that retailers post, post health and safety warning signs on the premises. And the last one highlighted on this slide is a prohibition against the consumption of marijuana on the premises. Um, while during the town hall meeting, we certainly um, heard from some individuals that they uh, perceive some benefits with the uh, ability to consume marijuana on the premises of businesses. Uh, we certainly feel there's a number of concerns in that regard, um, not least of which is people becoming impaired and then leaving a, a business. Uh, so we are recommending no consumption of marijuana on the premises, and this would apply both to businesses selling marijuana as well as um, standalone businesses. And you'll see in the, the recommendations themselves that part of the um, amendments to the zoning regulation bylaw would deal with those types of standalone businesses. Uh, and moving on with more of the business regulations that are recommended, um, that an air filtration system has to be installed and maintained. Um, also recommending that businesses have to submit um, a number of items as part of their initial business license application and on each renewal. Uh, that would be a security plan, police information checks for the applicants and on-site managers. Uh, we'd need to see proof of a security alarm contract and also proof of ownership or otherwise of legal possession of the premises. In terms of other security measures that have to be implemented while the business is open to the public, we're recommending that at least two employees have to be on duty at all times when the business is open and that windows can't be fully blocked. And so our final um, regulation in terms of security measures, uh, businesses also have to have uh, monitored video surveillance cameras, security and fire alarm systems, and when the business isn't in operation, uh, the valuables have to be removed from the premises or locked in a safe. In the staff report in the agenda package, there's a a number of detailed recommendations for council to give consideration to. In short, uh, this last slide um, highlights those, and that is to firstly direct staff to bring forward for council's consideration a zoning regulation amendment bylaw that uh, expressly prohibits um, storefront medical marijuana retailers unless they're permitted in, in a zone specifically, as well as businesses that allow consumption of marijuana on site. Second, to direct staff to bring forward for council's consideration a uh, medical marijuana related business regulation bylaw incorporating the approved regulations. Thirdly, to direct staff to bring forward for council's consideration uh, proposed amendments to the ticket bylaw that would establish penalties and fines for the, uh, the regulations that council would impose. And lastly, to direct staff to provide further details on the additional staff resource requirements in both the Sustainable Planning and Community Development Department as well as bylaw and licensing services. Uh, and that's uh, in particular once council's policy decisions have been confirmed and considered so that uh, the full impact of uh, staffing implications can be provided. And uh, Okay, thank you very much. Council, I'm going to run the table uh, for people who have questions. Uh, Councillor Madoff. Thank you. Just a, a very basic question at this point. If the recommendations were supported by council, what would be the process for existing businesses that are already within 200 meters of each other? Would it be first past the post in terms of a rezoning, or is there a process that you're suggesting? Um, through my helps, the short answer to the question is that it essentially would be the race to the swift. Um, the staff report does contain... Uh, a secondary uh, uh, alternative, which is to uh, to give consideration to all applications at, at one uh, instance. The recommendation is to not support that approach, um, and so it, it it would simply come down to uh, a matter of of individual consideration of individual applications based on the specific circumstances. Thank you, Councillor Coleman. Thank you whole bunch of questions um, but some of them just need to 
to steep for a bit, I suspect. Um, first of all, a question on advertising. How do you differentiate advertising from safety information warnings? Because you've got two different types of signage, one of which you want up and but you don't want to advertise. So this is that's advertising the negative for the concern side. So how did we come to that split? I think we anticipate that the health and safety warning signs would be signs that could be viewed inside the premises. I think when we're speaking of restrictions on advertising, that would be stuff that could be viewed outside of the premises. Okay, and I know that Councillor Alto and I had this discussion earlier, so I, I, will, I will share her part of the question. But how do you, if, if there's advertising, how do you um, figure out who it's being targeted to because adver it would be say, fair to say no advertising, but to then say no advertising to a specific class of potential viewers is very difficult to enforce. And certainly there would be an element of discretion there. I think it would be very hard for us to craft a bylaw that would possibly outline all the possible ways in which advertising could be directed to a minor. But just to provide you with a, a simple example, when we had 420, I saw this, uh, the store across the street was, had a big sign that advertised face painting. And to me, I thought, face painting, this seems like something targeted to minors. So uh, uh, there would be some discretion there, but I think it's anything that either the content of the message, the form of the message was somehow appealing to a younger audience. But absolutely, um, we won't be able to prescribe everything that would be a violation of that. There would obviously be some judgment and discretion involved. Thank you for that. Um, having spent 16 years as a marketer, I'm, I'm not sure how you can differentiate the messaging fairly. So I, I, I think that is discretion and perhaps common sense. But um, I, I will defer at the moment. I may have some other questions that I wish to ask. Thank you. Yeah, and this isn't your one and only opportunity. I just said questions, and I saw all hands go up. So I thought we just that way I don't have to keep track. I can just look across the table. Uh, Councillor Thornton, Joe. Thank you. <clears throat> I, I have. Uh, Quite a few questions, and some of them may have been covered in previous discussions, but I just need clarity. Uh, can we differentiate between, in, in a business license, between um, a nonprofit, sort of for like a compassion club that has a charity number, to a for profit business? Through my hopes, I think the short answer to that question is yes, and that. Um, there are ways to draw distinctions between different types or different classifications of businesses under a specific, more broad category. Um, and so, again, and I think with uh, one of the issues raised by uh, Councillor Coleman, too, is a bit of the devil in the details here with mm. uh, with that, that there's proposed regulations that would ultimately come forward and, and bylaw amendments that would enable uh, sort of the, the real fulsome discussion on, on some of the specifics there. But I think certainly there there is another municipality, I believe the City of Vancouver draws a distinction between um, not-for-profits versus for-profits. Thank you. Th thank you for that, because I think that piece is going to be uh, important. Um, consumption, uh, to not have consumption in uh, the facility, which I, I, I understand... But how do we balance the fact then, uh, so, for so you can't use in these location. However, we recognize that a majority of our citizens are rentals, which means that you may not be able to use uh, to, uh, in your, um, your residence. But also, uh, so if I can't use there and if I can't use in my apartment, I'm going to go to a park or in Centennial Square, and currently the bylaws have not kept up with that, in which case then it's not illegal. So are you not impacting more people by this than, like, so people that uh, won't use or don't use marijuana than, than those that do? So you're hurting the ones that don't and hurting the ones that do instead of... 
Yeah, I, th I, we, I mean, we certainly heard at the town hall meeting that there are some people that um, currently benefit um, from an on-site consumption room at one of our retailers. Having said that, the vast majority of our retailers do not allow on-site consumption. So there's obviously a number of customers that are, are finding ways um, to consume in another location. Um, I think the other thing to keep in mind is I know various methods of consumption have various benefits, but certainly smoking is isn't the only option. So if someone's living somewhere where smoking is inappropriate, perhaps they could use another method of consumption. Great, great. That's um, Sorry, regarding Mr. Coates, I think, wanted to add oh. something to that. Thank you, Mayor Helps. Just to follow up to that, um, with the uncertainty around what, what the federal government is going to do in relation to um, marijuana and medical marijuana, um, the staff report does make note of the fact that um, depending on council's considerations and subsequent decision making on these issues, those uh, federal schemes could certainly impact the regulations that the city might choose to implement and, and would certainly um, probably, if nothing else, cause a, a bit of a, a reanalysis of what regulations the city might choose to implement. And so thinking about that in terms of the usage in, in public spaces, so currently the uh, the CRD's clean air bylaw does not apply to um, marijuana because because of the legitimacy or lack thereof of the product, and so that regulatory regime can cause a number of other changes. So I think it's one of these things that we'd have to have a look at how that goes. But in in um, in a more parochial sense, the uh, the issue right now would be uh, that there would be if the regulations recommended were imposed. Um, Consumption would have to be done off-site. That certainly can promote the use in other areas that aren't currently regulated for the use of marijuana. Okay. Thank you. You still have the floor. Uh, okay, thank you. Um, no minors, so I support that, but how does it work in liquor stores? So a minor can't come in. I think it's uh, unless you're accompanied by a guardian or adult. So often when I'm at, a, say, a liquor store, you'll see a parent with a child. Would this still be the same for... This or would we need to uh, make it the bylaw that you had to be with a guardian or? It certainly had been suggested that we allow um, minors to be accompanied with a guardian, um, but the recommendation is no minors on the premises, absolutely. We realize that may have some impacts. Again, as with anything, there would be some discretion in enforcement. Obviously, if, if someone's in there with a very young child and says, I just had to run in here, you're probably not going to give them a ticket. Our concerns are, you know, with older children, if you say they can be accompanied um, and you find them in the store, you know, if they're with an adult friend, uh, they'll say they have an accompaniment there. I think the other reason that we feel that an absolute prohibition is necessary is because we can actually put in place a regulation that says you can't sell marijuana to a minor. That's outside of our authority. There are rules like that in place for liquor stores. You can't sell liquor to a minor. Um, so I think in the absence of having that tool, we're kind of relying on the second best tool, which is we just don't want to see them in the business. Hopefully that sort of has the effect of they're not being sold marijuana. Okay, and my last question for now is, you mentioned proximity to schools and similar businesses. Um, would we need to use wording if there was concerns about daycares or any other youth facility? Or do you think that covers, I saw I think in some other cities they had stronger language that had a little bit more than, than just uh, schools and, and similar businesses. So the exact wording that is in the proposed rezoning policy is um, that the retailer should be at least 200 meters in a straight line from closest lot line to closest lot line from a public or independent elementary or secondary school. So that covers the schools. And then also a storefront retailer should be at least 200 meters from another lot where a storefront retailer is permitted, whether or not active or not. So the way that the uh, proposed rezoning policy is worded now, it does not cover community centers or daycares. It only covers elementary and secondary schools and other 
similar by similar business we mean another storefront retailer certainly this is just a proposed uh, policy if council wis wishes to make changes absolutely and um, you'll notice from the recommendations at this point we're not asking for approval of the rezoning policy that would sort of come later after any public hearing on the zoning uh, proposed zoning regulation bylaw amendments if council wanted to go down that route so there's certainly still time to tweak this but what is proposed is simply a distance from schools and a distance from similar retailers. The reason we use that language, we're just modeling it on what we used for liquor retail stores. Okay, thank you for now. Thank you, Councillor Young. Questions? Thanks. Um, we've had those no smoking signs on the wall of city um, council chambers for many, many years. I remember, I think they're the same signs. I remember them because I think they were installed upside down. Um, so I'm a, I believe they predate the CRD no smoking bylaws. Um, and from, I'm a little, from what you said, it sounds as if um, anybody can light up in here now because the CRD smoking bylaws, you've said, apply only to cigarettes. And I assume ours probably did too, although I haven't read them, um, which means either you can smoke in here as long as it's marijuana or we have to basically impose fines and regulations and arrests or whatever and then people have to go to court and convince the judge that because it was marijuana and not tobacco they were allowed to do it and um, I, I guess the, the question is if we pass this, does this mean the marijuana shops will be the only place in the city where you can't smoke marijuana? Um, and so I, I, I'm, I have a, I, I do, I confess, um, have a little difficulty with the interpretation that says that our bylaws uh, only apply to tobacco. But and and I, I guess I would welcome any advice on how uh, that apparent loophole could be could be closed, um, recognizing obviously that we are in this odd situation where we have two sets of people making laws, the courts and the legislature, and it kind of is difficult for the public to know who to listen to. Um, I guess more seriously, I have two, con two concerns um, or two, two questions. Number one is the medical advice that we have been given on eating marijuana is fairly explicit. All of the, all of the uh, various things we've done with regard to safe cons consumption sites, um, needle exchanges, um, and uh, so far have been consistent with medical advice that says these things may be um, not consistent with public views. They may impose damage to the public, but they are good for the consumers, if you like, in terms of their overall health outcomes. We've received a couple of some communications that have been fairly explicit that to say that they do not believe that selling edible, edible products is consistent with the overall health on, outcomes of uh, our public or consumers. So I, I guess I am uh, troubled by the advice that we should um, not, your advice, that we should not heed their advice. Um, the second thing that I could ask you to address is this um, 200 meters from other establishments and I guess I am not, I can see a whole lot of concerns that people have with marijuana retailers, but I can't see any additional concerns that would result from having five of them lined up in a row. Uh, why, yeah, they're con competing, but they're subject to all the issues of security and um, uh, the advertising regulations and so forth. Why is it a bad thing that they're all together instead of spread out in every neighborhood so uh, they're convenient to the consumers? 
So I think with regard to the latter question about the 200 meter um, distance from other retailers, um, certainly in doing our best practices review, we saw that this was certainly a best practice in a lot of other jurisdictions. Um, Vancouver, I believe Denver, Portland had similar restrictions. And I actually, as part of the research on this, you know, contacted our community planning staff and said, what, what's the best thoughts in community planning? Do you want these things clustered in one area or do you want them spread out? And the answer I received was, well, there's sort of different schools of thought on that. Um, so I don't think from a, you know, a planning perspective, there's a real definitive answer. I think some of the uh, issues associated with clustering of businesses would be neighborhood impacts. Um, I've heard terms like ghettoization of an area if you have too many of a similar type of business in that area uh, that might have some neighborhood impacts like like loitering, late night hours, those sorts of things. Um, one of the other possible benefits that could be achieved from the 200 meter rule would be to limit the number of businesses in the city if that's an objective that um, council would like to achieve that might serve to achieve some of those um, objectives as well. Mr. Coates. Humor helps. Then in terms of the first question about, uh, about the edibles, and so it, it's a particular challenge and has been a particular challenge in, in trying to um, rationalize a, a recommendation for council to consider in, in this regard. So initially the, the recommendations were um, uh, for council to consider not taking that on the public feedback was was quite strong around um, sort of other related benefits to the consumer about um, using marijuana in a form that isn't smoked so the health the health benefits of that uh, the lack of the regulatory um, ability of the city to become involved in in a, in a regulatory scheme on edibles is problematic um, and so it's it's one of these one of the most difficult recommendations I think that that we had to formulate to to present, um, and so I think sort of leaving it at that that it is very difficult. The medical officer of health is continues to be strong as council's aware with his recent correspondence in relation to the recommendations that are before you, and so uh, it, it's just a particular challenge to come forward with a recommendation either way that isn't sort of fraught with um, issues on either side. Thank you. Do you have further questions? Okay. Um, I, I have a significant comment and potential path forward with regards to edibles, but it's not a question. My, my quest, so I'll, I'll leave it. <clears throat> my, my question is um, this prohibition of other businesses uh, on site other than related uses. And I remember we had a presentation at the town hall meeting uh, from a, a young man. I don't remember which dispensary he was with. And they also provide other health services. And I don't remember if it was acupuncture or, or, or some other thing, but kind of wrapped into this health and wellness. So would that be allowed or prohibited under this proposal? I, I, I get that you're trying to, it sounds like we're trying to prohibit kind of cafes and recreational use, but are, are other kind of related health and wellness activities, would, would they be, or could they be uh, allowed? I think generally, no. If it's a other type of business that would, um, you know, cater to minors or typically minors would be able to enter. So, you know, health services, medical clinic, um, I think those would be prohibited as not accessory related uses under the proposed regulations. Having said that, I do know, um, you know, one business has approached me, um, indicated desire to provide health services, but they're going to have a separate entrance and a separate area. So certainly, you know, if it's a, a separate business, separate entrance, um, but it's sort of associated with a neighboring business, that's fine. Okay, thank you. And that might be the way that this uh, business, whoever it might be, plans to get around it. Thank you. That was my only question. Councillor Alto, questions? Actually, I actually have a process question first. I, I think I understood you correctly, but just clarify. Uh, if there are specific um, amendments, let's call them, to the actual regulations that were in the staff report uh, listed under Section 2, you don't want those today. You just want us to comment on their substance, and then when you come back, you'll actually reflect those comments. Is that right? Through my hopes, I think that um, there's another opportunity because the, the regulations that are brought forward for council to consider here are fairly broad and, and probably do need to be mm -hmm. flushed out a little bit further, but certainly there's an opportunity or 
and an expectation that if council wishes to make specific comments on any of those regulations today, that's certainly an opportunity as well. Okay. So I do have some questions, but I'll, I'll leave my comment. And specifically, I was going to make an amendment actually to the advertising piece, but I'll, I'll save that piece as a comment. A couple of questions. So um, when you're looking at uh, 1B that's on your screen there, and it says uh, one of the prohibitions is allowing consumption on site. In the previous um, preamble, it says, unless expressly permitted, does that imply that an individual business could apply for an exemption to allow consumption on site? And that we would consider that one by one? Through more helps, yes, um, because any, any zoning regulations can be applied to be modified through the, the rezoning process. Um, so I think the the idea behind the first point of this recommendation is to is, is to make sort of a broad and general establishment in the zoning bylaw that that the uh, the retail and consumption of marijuana in the city is prohibited in in any zone unless it's expressly permitted in another one and so that then because there is no uh, permitted uses in any of the other zones that take on those two issues that they would be applied for um, mm -hmm. yes so I could apply for the purposes of having the site and also specifically say I would also like to apply for an exemption to allow consumption. Okay, thank you for that. Um, referenced in some of your regulations uh, are the requirements for video uh, recording or videotaping and monitoring of the videotaping. Does that also imply that there would be a time period during which those recordings would have to be kept so they could be reviewed after the fact or are they just live cameras? Yes, there'll be a requirement for keep, I believe 21 days is sort of the accepted industry standard. Those types of details would come forward um, with the bylaw amendments. Great, very good. And uh, I was going to ask you to talk about enforcement, but I'll leave that because you did do a really good job of explaining that in the report. Um, and uh, I was going to also ask about the Compassion Club's differential, but I, I think that that question has been asked and we'll comment on that in a second. Um, let me just clarify what I think I understand. So the zoning application, uh, the application of the zoning bylaw would apply to the entire city. And so even the, ex both the existing and potentially new uh, services would come forward to apply for permitting uh, wherever they were, it didn't matter. And it didn't matter if they exist or they're brand new, correct? Uh, through my helps, yes, that's that's the approach. That so, in order to establish a baseline, is that it's it's not permitted anywhere, and so that means uh, it would prompt a, an application from any any business that wanted to to carry forward with that sort of operation. Okay, great. And then I think finally, my last question, and I certainly will have some comments in a minute. Um, you referenced coming back with some comments about the effect on staffing resources of applying and enforcing this new regulatory scheme. But one of the pieces uh, that struck me in reading it was the likely considerable uh, impact that this would have on community associations as we require them to participate in Calhoun uh, events. And I think that it was fair to say, looking at the mapping, that a significant and disproportionate amount of that resourcing and challenge would fall to the Downtown Residents Association. So as you consider the uh, resource impacts on city staff, I wonder if you have or could uh, give any thoughts to the potential need to provide some resourcing for community associations, uh, particularly for the DRA, because the preponderance of the existing locations uh, certainly appear to be in the downtown core. Is that something you've given any thought to? Through your helps, I think that Direct answer to that is is likely not, um, but certainly in the broader context, uh, and Director Tinney might be able to uh, to elaborate a little better on on that from the from his department's perspective. But thirty applications or or more is a significant uh, number, and it has quite a quite an ability to to really spike and skew the mm -hmm. the sort of standard number of applications that the city sees. So I think the the resource implications throughout. Um, are, are going to be hampered and, and mm -hmm. severely impacted. There, there's a, a processing time expected with all of these. And so, um, you know, the potential to, to log jam at, 
at a pinch point is, is certainly going to be there. And, and it's not a question of being able to expand the, the resource capacity, I suppose, of, of, the, of the associations because they are sort of what they are generally. And mm -hmm. so um, it is a complicated process in the event that there was a, a, a sudden spike mm -hmm. in numbers because it is quite yeah. unconventional. Yeah, I, th I thank you for that answer. I think that is, um, well, I'll make some comments on that when time comes for comments. And uh, actually, I think those were all, actually all the questions that haven't yet been asked. Thank okay. you. Okay, thank you. I have Councillor Loveday and then Councillor Lucas with questions. Uh, thank you for the very thorough report. Um, I've got a number of questions here. Uh, first one is looking at the, the cost of the business licenses, uh, it's still projected at four to five thousand. And I, I'm wondering if you could break that down a little bit. I'm, I want to make sure there it seems like if, if all of these uh, businesses are applying for rezonings, that will be a tremendous amount of staff time as well as uh, enforcement. And so is that 5,000 still considered to be cost recovery? Through my hopes, this is one of the biggest challenges to try to uh, to attach value to to something that we're not really quite clear on what that looks like. So there are two ingredients here that I think are important to distinguish between. One is the the application process, which um, in and of itself can can look to achieve cost recovery um, for the for the process of going through the rezoning applications. And so that's quite distinct from the business license piece. And so um, on, on the business license side, which is where the four to $5,000 estimate comes from, this is a number that, um, that was developed uh, through sort of the best and, and highest level of analysis that staff could take at the time without, um, you know, sort of a clear indicator on what what that really looks like. So from essentially from pillar to post, from, from the beginning of the business that license application process through to enforcement for this group of businesses on mass. And so, and that includes a city staff time uh, enforcement um, components, as including both um, bylaw services and Vic PD. So it, it is all as all encompassing as it can be. But in order to really determine what cost recovery is all about, it really does have to have an analysis after the first year to see what the mark looks like at that point, because there would be quantifiable costs to, to identify. Thanks. And uh, looking at the, the 200 meters from uh, school specifically, I was at the North Park Neighborhood Association last night and they brought up, uh, was it con uh, the idea of 200 meters to playgrounds um, and wondering if that was considered? Uh, it certainly was because we did hear from some participants and engagement that they were concerned about playgrounds. As I said earlier, we are we were basing the rezoning policy on what we have currently for liquor retail stores as sort of an expression of our own community standards um, in terms of keeping something like alcohol away from minors, um, and that does not reference playgrounds. I guess the other consideration um, is I, I would generally think that playgrounds would attract a younger um, younger group of minors. I think we're more concerned about schools, uh, sp specifically high schools, as that might be the older uh, group of teens that might be more likely to um, be harms if they were exposed to minor. Okay. Um, and looking at uh, the, inf the enforcement side of things, and, and if we get to a place where there are, uh, you know, for example, in North Park, there are a number of uh, dispensaries that are currently within 200 meters of each other and so uh, what I'm hearing is that it would be a uh, almost a, a race is that in in a way uh, and is there a way to consider how their operations have been to date in terms of have they been good neighbors have they been trying to follow the rules that are currently in place and 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 generally yeah, generally fitting in and integrating into the neighborhood as a upstanding uh, part of it. Um, it's a bit difficult to uh, to sort of forecast exactly what that would look like. Uh, certainly, I think that the uh, the public input opportunities would be a test of whether or not there's issues that have been created by a particular operation over the course of time, and so with 
the standard city process is being anticipated, which is the Community Association Land Use Committee meetings, that, that would probably serve as the, the sort of strongest grassroots ability to try to identify that. I think one of the problems that, um, that exist is that currently none of these businesses are licensed by the city, and so there isn't a lot of or any kind of formality around any sort of ongoing reporting. Um, and so there may well be complaints that are launched, but, but certainly they're not um, in great numbers. So there, there isn't a lot to sort of base any kind of um, consideration on with some solid feedback through a, a standard sort of past practice operational perspective. And so I think that's, that's what challenges this a little bit. And Sorry, Ms. Cray wanted to add something as well. Yeah, I just thought I'd add, just as a caution, um, certainly when we're considering rezoning, that is something a, per, a permitted use would attach to a location rather than an individual. So I think in reviewing rezoning applications, if we go down this route, you know, council will have to be cognizant that that approval will attach to that location, and you may get a new operator in. Um, so that might not be the best avenue for sort of dealing with individual operators, certainly through business licensing we have um, much better ability to deal with problem individuals in terms of because we issue licenses to individuals. Right. And, and looking at the, the time lag, lag, like working back, uh, so I guess this is multiple questions, but the, the federal government has said they're looking to spring 2017 have, have marijuana be legal. So working back, if, if rezoning processes take six months um if we're we're starting from now I, I mean we can get from today to spring 2017 pretty easily um with our regulations just be coming into effect so i uh i guess have we heard anything new from the federal government as to how they plan to bring in uh legalized marijuana for example, if it's in, if they just decide that it has to go in liquor stores, that is uh, most of what we're doing will be moot. Uh, but if we're, but if they're selling it, uh, in a sort of more of a free market type of way, um, then these regulations will, can, most of them will be able to stay in effect. So, have we heard anything new? Through my help, and so unfortunately, no, there, there isn't a lot of direction or clarity on what the federal government's decision making is going to look like, and so that there just isn't much to base that on. And uh, I guess further to that, so looking at um, the recommended process through is through a rezoning, and did, did we consider just adding retail medical marijuana dispensary to a different zoning? Uh, to a different zone, so adding that as a fair use, so that we, so there wouldn't need to be rezoning for each individual, and we could just deal with it as a business licenses. That certainly is an option that's available to council. I believe in the first report we brought back in November, we had sort of outlined a number of uh, ways of which council could address any concerns they would have about business locations. So I believe that is the approach, say, that Vancouver used. They just added marijuana sales as a permitted use in specific commercial zones. So that certainly is an option to council. Um, you wouldn't then likely have the opportunity for individual rezonings and individual input on each application. Uh, also, I just would add, um, we've been advised that that isn't, um, unless you sort of mapped out those areas and found the ones that weren't close to other schools, um, it wouldn't be an effective way of doing the distancing requirements, certainly not between retailers, because once an area was uh, retail use was allowed in that zone, you could have five or ten establishing in the same zone. So it wouldn't be effective if council wished to regulate the distance between businesses. Right. Okay. Um, and a question regarding the, the non-profits. So we have, I mean, it seems to me there's a difference between nonprofits and compassion clubs, and there, there, there's a number of dispensaries I believe that are uh, are nonprofit organizations, but uh, perhaps their board mem members are being paid quite well. Perhaps 
there it, it's just a way to not need a business license, but it, it's different than the compassion clubs that have been operating for decades with very little problem in in uh, in our city. So I'm, I'm wondering how how would we define that and the difference between a compassion club and a nonprofit? Well, and I think that hits at the difficulty that we face. Certainly when we brought the proposed regulations um, to this committee, we heard that there was some desire to distinguish between compassion clubs and other businesses. We have just haven't really been able to identify some sort of distinguishing feature that would allow us to specifically say compassion club is something very different um, as opposed to another retailer. And the concern is this, if you can't clearly distinguish them, then everyone will f find their way to make themselves be a compassion club. And, and presumably the um, intent in having a distinction is either to relax some of the regulations for compassion clubs or have a cheaper business license fee for compassion clubs. So certainly, um, you know, we'd have to work out what distinction uh, needed to be made and, and what would flow from that. But the problem is if we can't clearly distinguish them if there's advantage to being a compassion club, every business will find a way to say that they're a compassion club. Okay, and um, I think last question for now is looking at, uh, you know, I, I, I do believe that a lot of the dispensaries have really tried to fit into the neighborhood and, and positively contribute. Um, it's, I, I've, heard that that other dispensaries in other locations have uh, connections to uh, crime organized crime that sort of thing so how would if when we're looking at rezoning and we're looking at giving out business licenses how do we uh, make sure that we are only giving rezonings to the ones that are legitimately distributing medical marijuana in a in a way that's benefiting the patients that need it. Through your helps, um, so with with a suite of regulations that, if council were to to adopt them, um, that will serve as the uh, sort of the um, operational approach that that the businesses have to comply with from to the extent that the city is able to regulate and and I think this is where it's probably important to make reference to the notion that the city's trying to regulate something that to is within its purview and, and so there's only pieces of that that are within the city's purview to regulate and that's certain business elements because the actual product and and the primary activity is not something that the city can sort of um, consent to or not consent to because it's outside the city's jurisdiction the, the whole issue of of the sale or of medical marijuana, so um, so that makes for another set of challenges with with trying to manage that, and that's sort of fundamental to the to the approach. That's it for me now. Yeah. Thank you, Councillor Lucas. Thank you. Um, you know, so many of these regulations that are put forward, as you've mentioned, uh, are very similar to uh, running a, a licensed retail store or a liquor store. Um, but the one difference that, that I see, and so my question is around police. So uh, if I have a problem at the liquor store across the street at the hotel, I call the police, they come in, and they go after the thief or the troublemaker or the underage uh, people that are in there, and they charge them. So what happens when the police get a call to go into one of these stores? Do they have to arrest the owner of the store because they are selling a illegal drug, as well as go after the person who is doing the theft? Like, where? what happens to the police in this situation if we actually say that these are now going to be regulated by us at City Hall? Where do the police fit into this? Through Mayor Helps. The, um, I think the role of the police in this is generally outside of the, the regulatory scheme that, that council is giving consideration to. And so that is the standard, um, the standard approach that they would take with any kind of federal jurisdiction here. And so in terms of the regulations that council is giving consideration to, much of that, if not all of that, is is something that the city, through our, our bylaw enforcement group, would 
would monitor and manage on an ongoing basis and and there may be instances of overlap depending on certain of the regulations but for the most part the bulk of them would be something that our bylaw enforcement group would look after and again exclusive of the product because the city has no ability to regulate the the, the product sale or, or production or distribution so in the case of just so i make sure i get this right at the liquor store, if I am outside the boundaries or, and bylaw sees somebody in there that's over the age of nine or under the age of 19, they deal with that. But if it's an issue that somebody comes in with a gun, bylaw, I, I wouldn't be calling bylaw for something like that. How will these shops be able to know that they can call the police when they're selling it. Like, have we heard from the police on how they feel that they're going to fit into all of this? Through Mayor Helps. So, so um, through the process, and certainly the last time this issue was before Council in November, Vic PD was present. Um, maybe I'll defer to Ms. Craig to, to just talk about some of the history that she's got more of than I do in, in so far as, as Vic PD's role. But certainly, I think just to bring again to Council's attention that part of the, the whole process of why these recommendations are are under consideration and this issue is brought before you is because of concerns of Vic PD as well and I'll just defer to Ms. Craig for some more details on that. Yeah, so certainly when it comes to enforcement of, of criminal laws and absolutely if a business was being robbed um, as part of what they need for their security plan, there will be a buzzer system, the alarm company would contact the police who would attend and and police have attended in the past when they've had incidents of this business. So absolutely a bylaw officer would not get involved if there was sort of a, a criminal complaint that there was a theft or a robbery or something like that. But uh, certainly as Mr. Coates said, in terms of our business regulations, um, in terms of you know under the age of 19 or um, advertising or not having the warning signs on the premises, we would definitely see those as things that our city bylaw enforcement officers would look to. I think with regard to the actual sale of marijuana, which we know is illegal, I don't want to put words in the police's mouth, but certainly we've heard from them before that they prioritize um, their enforcement. So certainly if they hear about sales to minors, organized crime involvement, um, they will look into and investigate and take action there as well. Thank you. Um, I have some questions that have arisen from the questions of my colleagues, but I think in the interest of moving forward, um, if someone wants to put their recommendations on the table, we can discuss, ask questions, and, and then at a certain point. Uh, the reason I'm hesitating, Council, about a lunch break is we have an open Council meeting after this meeting, and we have the Native Friendship Centre who needs to make a presentation to us. We gave them a time estimate. They've gone away and will be coming back, so I'm trying to accommodate um, their their needs as well as our needs to eat so um having said that if we could just keep going for a little while longer everyone's nodding maybe we could even dispense with this item before we take a lunch break so i will look um to someone to put some recommendations on the table or something on the table for our discussion thank you staff recommendations moved by councillor alto seconded by councillor thornton joe um, I'll go to the mover and the seconder for um, to speak, and then I won't run the table because um, sometimes people don't have anything to say until someone else says something, so I'll keep a speaker's list. Councillor Alto, Councillor sure. Thornton-Joe, and then Councillor Coleman. Um, generally speaking, I think, uh, I think staff's done an awesome job trying to put something together in an extremely difficult situation. Um, you know, some of the comments of my colleagues uh, remind me that I wasn't uh, particularly supportive of us moving in this direction back last fall in the anticipation that the federal government would come forward with some more specific direction and I gather that they will and the fact that it's going to take them another year means obviously that this is something we should attend to now although I think it is likely that we may find ourselves uh, with a very short time frame of application of these regulations at least I hope it would be uh, that being said there's just a few things on which I'd like to comment um, I am particularly uh, firm on my notion that there should be no advertising at all. Uh, and were we in a position where we're making actual making amendments and we had the list uh, of uh, the pieces of the regulatory uh, sections, I would have made that am amendment, but perhaps I'll just make that comment for the uh, utility of staff. Uh, I don't think that this uh, particular uh, product should be treated much differently than the uh, rules we have currently for tobacco. 
So if we're going to try and go down that thorny road of we don't want to advertise to kids, I think we have to just cut the line and so we don't advertise at all. That's just my thought on that. Uh, in particular, uh, in addition, I do think that although it's going to be extremely difficult, that we have to find a way to incorporate compassion clubs in a different way than we would in, uh, uh, incorporate certainly for-profit businesses. And even, and I take the point of my colleague, even perhaps those who could be not for profit but are different from compassion clubs. And I know that's a huge challenge for you. I'm not sure I have any sage advice to offer you on how to do that, but I do think that there's precedent in history for at least a few organizations uh, in the city who have long standing histories, uh, who I'm sure we could find a way to uh, discover aspects of their service that could distinguish them from others. So, uh, that for me is a very important uh, piece to say uh, as well. Um, I think that we do have to turn our attention to the issue of the resources for the residents associations who will be dealing with Calook if we go down this road. Uh, and I think in particular, not just with the resource issue, but we have to provide them with some very specific and detailed instructions on what are allowable considerations. So those Calook meetings do not turn into free-for-alls and where they have instructions to say, you know, when we're doing this Calook review of this particular application, the issues on which we are allowed to consider are, and then they list them out so that they have some help and being able to provide order for that process. If we're going to require them to do that, we need to help them. And we need to help them make it efficient and useful. Uh, in addition, I guess um, I would just say that uh, I really appreciate the fact that we are reconsidering the two previous recommendations on prohibiting edibles uh, and prohibiting delivery and mail order. I know the edibles piece is still a controversial one because of all of the completely legitimate issues around quality uh, and, and uh, regulation and whatnot. But I do think that for me anyway, a comp compelling arguments were made during our public engagement that that is uh, an alternative way of ingesting uh, this product which needs to remain on the table for those people who are unable to uh, to use any other ways of, uh, of consuming it. And on the delivery and mail order piece, uh, I think that there, again, there were very persuasive uh, comments for me around the folks who were simply unable to get to any of these establishments and so need that assistance as well. Uh, I think those are my comments uh, and, and suggestions, I guess, or requests of staff when they come back. Uh, again, I want to offer you my extreme thanks in trying to wrestle with what is incredibly difficult in the absence of any clear direction uh, from the federal government. And I will offer my sympathy to the fact that you are likely going to be doing this work again in less than a year. And I hope that at that time, much of this will still be relevant. So thank you for that. Okay, thank you. I have the seconder, Councillor Thornton-Joe, and then Councillor Coleman, Councillor Madoff, Councillor Young, Councillor Lucas. So I will be supporting the motion, and I also want to uh, comment, uh, thank staff for the hard work. I'm sure uh, Ms. Craig has learned more about the issue than she ever thought she would have to learn, and, and I can tell by her responses that she has been um, definitely doing the work to, to educate herself and, and to be able to educate uh, council. So I appreciate that. Um, you know, I think... The, the difficulty is, of course, is we're, we're licensing something that is not has not caught up uh, where the legalization uh, for uh, for federally has gotten, and we know we're headed that way. But it's it's sort of the timing that's making this a little bit more difficult. Uh, and, and I think for some of the decisions we're making, this is just a start. And and I think as um, you know, the federal legislation changes. Um, I think we'll be back here making some amendments in the future. So I think for those who found some of these were too restrictive, I think this is at least a start for us. And we may see that, uh, you know, the public's fears on some things are not going to be realized. We may find there's new issues that we may need to uh, um, think about and maybe put in other restrictions. Um, that will be something that time will tell. I like the fact that there may be some opportunity to have exemptions and, and it will come back to council for certain items uh, for approval. I, as I, the reason why I brought up the question about the nonprofits and for profit, um, I do think that we need to look at uh, whether there's some opportunity for uh, compassion uh, clubs to be looked at in, in perhaps a, a different way. Um, one of the questions I did have is, is, Profit and nonprofit is, 
is, is also the word, if whether we're looking at medicinal marijuana or we're looking at recreational uh, use of marijuana. And when I look at um, um, Appendix D, when we look like at storefront marijuana and the definition being a premises where marijuana or product containing marijuana is distributed, I'm a little confused of whether these businesses are supposed to only be for medicinal purposes. And I know that there's opens up a whole different uh, category of whether there is strong enough, um, I don't know, um, policy in place where, how people can get a, uh, a medical approval. But are we saying that this is for recreational use as well or for, and if so, should it be in the wording that is, it is medical, storefront medical marijuana retail, uh, retailer, not just retailer for marijuana? So that's a question, then I have a final, final comment. Um, yes, we've drafted the rezoning policy um, and to specifically just talk about marijuana generally, we're hoping to anticipate any changes in the federal regime. Presumably from a community perspective, the same issues would be of concern to the community, whether it was selling for medical or recreational purposes. So we've done that by design. We feel that that would uh, place us in a good position for any new scheme that comes down from the federal government. So yes, we're specifically just talking about marijuana in terms of the rezoning. We don't have the authority to regulate um, who the product is being sold to. Uh, so, you know, you will see there's nothing in our proposed regulations that says you're only selling for medical purposes. We simply don't have that authority. So we're trying to capture what may be coming down the road uh, with new federal regulations. Okay, thank you for that uh, clarification. Um, I, I do want to echo Councillor Alto, and I think Councillor Coleman mentioned that I, I would like to see no advertising. Uh, besides the signs so that people can know uh, what the business is. Uh, I think we've already seen uh, advertising of saying special for the week. Um, and, and it's not even just uh, marijuana. In, in the work I've done on alcohol-related issues and, and downtown issues, um, you know, one of the books that I read about late-night bar behavior is not having advertising for uh, alcohol. Um, um, so, you know, hap you know, the... 250 Tuesdays or things. Those are things that um, have been found to actually be more problematic than, although it may be positive for the business. Uh, when it comes to regulation, it makes it a little bit more difficult. So I would be happy to have no advertising. And I do think we'll have to look at uh, where minors are. I know, I've, as I said, I've had a complaint from uh, uh, a neighborhood that has a daycare and whether we should be uh, uh, considering that as well. So I, I don't know where at some point, but I do think that there needs to be somewhere in the motion, whether it's today or whether when it comes back to us, that uh, this definitely would need to be reviewed uh, in a year once it's in, in, in effect so that we can look at whether the, we can uh, lessen some of the uh, regulations or whether there's some that need to be made stronger. So, But thank you for all the work that the staff has done on this. Thank you. I have Councillor Coleman next. Thank you. And... Again, thank you for all the work done. Um, I know it's been much broader than you probably first thought it would be. Um, much appreciated. All four of the recommendations are directing staff to go off and do some more work. But in the answer to some of the questions posed earlier, there was the notion that there would be discretion. Um, and, and I understand that, and discretion is usually based on common sense, but quite often common sense is not a common property. So as we go through this, I, I need to understand who the discretion is vested in. Um, is it the bylaw officer who goes to a site? Is it Mr. Coates? Uh, is it ultimately appealable to council? Or is, I mean, so I just need to go through that regulatory process. So as we're going through those areas of discretion and uh, I, I think it's why perhaps Councillor Alto and Councillor Thornton Joe said they would like more definitive uh, regulations around no advertising because at least there's no discretion and it doesn't run the, the, the problem of vagueness at some point down the line. Uh, but I think that these are the, the right things to focus on. Um, I think we need to be very careful and clear as we talk about the community engagement process. And I think that's been alluded to a couple of times already. But uh, I'm quite willing to support this, knowing that it gives you more work to do. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> 
and for other reasons too, no doubt. Uh, Councillor Madoff. Thank you. Uh, I too am in support of the recommendations. Um, it's interesting looking at these, uh, dealing with such a complex issue, but they've been distilled uh, down into, in such a way that there's a simplicity and a straightforwardness to the recommendations, which belies the complexity of the issue and all that's gone into it. And I think that's a testament to the, to the work that staff has done in being able to focus on where we have authority and what's practicable as well. Many of the issues that I'm particular interest in have been referenced by my colleagues, but just in order to emphasize them, the areas that I'm uh, particularly interested in or supportive of, the first thing would be um, no advertising of any kind. Uh, and whatever work it takes for us to be able to create uh, a differentiation between compassion clubs, not-for-profit, and retail. And I recognize how easy it is to kind of hide behind a not-for-profit notion. But I think there has to be a way, and hopefully through perhaps other jurisdictions, best practices, because I think we've seen how the compassion clubs have operated, and that's actually the model that I would like to see us following in some ways. So I'd like to see them not being... Um, uh, really uh, affected monetarily by a, a, you know, a, a very significant business license fee. I'd also like to um, have the notion of um, daycares looked into uh, playgrounds and community centers. And depending on the lens of whether you think it's the, uh, the operation that affects the playground or whether you think it's the playground that affects the operation, we might want to turn our minds to that as well, just in terms of, of what the impact uh, might be. Uh, there was a question raised about clustering uh, versus distributed, and I'm very much in favor of distributed. I've seen what's happened in other cities, regardless of what the initiative is, when um, any particular activity is clustered, even something as potentially benign as entertainment. I think we've seen what's happened when entertainment districts are created. So for me, I see a real benefit in a distributed model that follows the regulations that the um, city would put forward. I'm also interested in how um, related health and wellness practitioners could be accommodated and whether that would be through the separate entrance and separate area, but I think the notion of, of really being able to connect uh, marijuana consumption with health and wellness um, should be something that would be uh, encouraged through very clear guidelines. And finally, and perhaps uh, the one I would emphasize the most, is the ability to um, offer edibles. I don't think it's our role to determine uh, or to deal with the concerns that were uh, communicated to us by the um, health authorities. I think that's going to come from the federal government in terms of what the, um, the strength is, clear labeling and that kind of thing. But my concerns in terms of folks who are not able or not willing to smoke marijuana but need it for medicinal purposes and are able to consume it uh, in another fashion is really important and we would be eradicating a, a huge portion of the, the public that does use marijuana for medical therapy who would not be able to smoke it so I hope we'll be able to deal with that as well but otherwise it's just thank you to staff this is an incredibly complex issue but I think it's been distilled in such a way that we can deal with it in a very business-like way which I really appreciate. Thank you, uh, Councillor Young, and then Councillor Lucas, and then I would like to speak as well. Well, well like Councillor Alto, I was um, not happy about us having to enter into this whole area of regulation. Um, it's, it's, um, but we've been forced into it by the situation we're in, which is that the courts are unwilling to enforce current regulation and, and now complicated by the fact that, that we know that uh, legislation will change. Um, that said, uh, I share some of the concerns um, that my colleagues have expressed and I believe uh, that before sending this forward we should uh, provide further guidance to staff uh, on these various issues. Um, partly because it will determine whether I can support it, but also just to um, uh, give the public a, a clear idea of the direction we're going. Um, I, I would support the prohibition against advertising. Um, 
the compassion clubs, um, I think we have to be a lot more precise about what we mean if we're going, if we want changes there. I seem to recall a gentleman who was associated with the compassion club in this chamber talking about uh, some uh, tax issues, income tax issues that he had had. And um, I was led to believe from what he said that his income from uh, the Compassion Club was in fact very substantial. And um, uh, surprisingly so. And so it may have been a Compassion Club, but it was by no means, by my understanding from what he said, a non-profit and in fact was quite the opposite. I think if we want to set up regulations along those lines, as the staff said, we can't just go by what people call themselves. Somebody's going to trademark the name Compassion Club Marijuana Cigarettes or something. We've got to, we've got to lay out a, uh, a set of um, rules, the simplest would be to follow the federal regulations for taxation with regard to charitable status or nonprofit status. So we could, we can follow those regulations if we feel that it's worthwhile to do so. It, that's not a particular interest of mine, but those um, for whom it is should certainly think along those lines. Um, I'm, I'm not prepared to support the 200 meter um, uh, prohibition. It's mostly, I, I, I guess there may be some small benefits, but I am thinking of the issue that um, Councillor Loveday raised, which is by the time we get through this process, it's, it's already complicated enough. If we then layer on top of the complications we're going to face, this idea of people competing with our staff to get their application in first and to get and to get to us first or to get first on the meeting agenda so they get approved before the next guy comes in who's two, 150 meters away and the other guy was approved five minutes before. What happens then? I mean, we're, we're just, it's complicated enough. Let's not add, add one more um, layer onto it. And finally, the um, issue of edibles. I uh, yes, we are in a situation where uh, we are essentially regulating something that's illegal. It's illegal because some government has considered it to be harmful. But now we are violating specific uh, medical advice. I think the people who want edibles. Um, should uh, develop further regulations if they want them to be added that deal with the issue of how you make them unattractive to children or whatever you have to do to make it so that the health issues that were identified um, do not materialize. Um, and until that happens, I'm not prepared to provide a blanket um, uh, permission. We may even, as I say, be, go be going well past what the federal government in the future will be allowing, so we'll have to pull back. Um, so uh, procedurally, um, uh, although some of these things are in the main motion, some of them are in the regulations, I think uh, it's important to deal with them. Um, I'd be prepared to uh, offer amendments or uh, to the motion that would um, allow us to address these things. Sure. Um, well, you one have at a time. Yeah, well, I, I will move that um, uh, advertising not be permitted beyond um, minimal signage. Seconder. Okay, seconded by Councillor Thornton Joe. Discussion? Okay, I will call the question. All those in favor of that amendment? Any opposed? Okay, thank you. Next, Councillor Young. Um, I would move that the 200 meter um, regulation uh, be removed. Sorry, and just to be clear, do you mean 200 meters? Two, 200, sorry, 200 meters from another store. Okay, is there a seconder? Okay, seconded by Councillor Coleman. Um, you've motivated already. Do you wish to say anything else? No. Thanks. Um, uh, yeah, I'm going to speak and then I'll go to Councillor Loveday and Councillor Lucas. Um, 
I, I don't support this amendment and the only reason, well not the only reason, one of the primary reasons that I don't is because our staff didn't reinvent the wheel here. They looked at what Vancouver was doing and Vancouver has I think a 300 meter distance between um, retail stores but they also have a larger city and a larger downtown. So I think this is completely supportable and based on Vancouver's experience, they're a little bit ahead of us, seems to be working. I agree. It, I don't know how people are going to decide, you know, I guess it's whoever gets their, gets organized first, gets their application in, holds their community meeting, but I, I don't know why we would, this is, this would be a substantial diversion from what Vancouver is doing, and I, and I, I don't understand why we would, um, you know, until the federal government comes, comes into, um, creates their regulatory regime, why we would have different kind of patchwork approaches across British Columbia, so I'm strongly opposed to this amendment for those reasons. Um, Councillor Loveday and then Councillor Lucas. I think in some ways this uh, <clears throat> this amendment makes us really face down what we're doing here and the fact that we have uh, dispensaries that are essentially purporting to sell only medical marijuana. And if this is going just to patients, then it's we don't regulate how far pharmacies are from each other um, and we don't regulate how far doctor's offices are or any other health facility. So if this is a health facility, then I, I agree that we shouldn't have a 200 meter thing. If we're, if we're saying that there are different negative uh, or potential negative impacts to the neighborhood because of these facilities, um, then the 200 meters makes sense. So is it, uh, is it a health facility or, or is this uh, have the same impacts as say a liquor store? Um, and I think it's something we have to grapple with and in looking at that, uh, yeah. Thank you, Councillor Lucas. Well, I'm opposed, or I, I would like to see the 200 meters put in there. And the reason being is because if in the spring of 2017, if we're lucky, um, and they come down and they legalize marijuana, um, then we will, we will see the stores that will be doing more than just giving out medical marijuana. And if we look at the liquor stores, we learned that in 2002 when we all applied excuse me, when we all applied for licenses, um, we got too many in the downtown core that uh, was very difficult on resources, so police resources, bylaw resources. And so now we're all grandfathered, and we, the ones in the downtown core, we can't move or we, we go under the new regulations. So it was proven then that we should not be too close to each other due to resources. If, if, as Councillor Loveday says, you know, if it was medical marijuana, that's one thing. But we don't know what's going to happen in the spring of 2017. If they do legalize, then if we have that many stores, we're going to see a draw on resources just like we do with the liquor stores. Further discussion on the amendment? Yes, Councillor Coleman as a seconder. It's an interesting analogy, but when the liquor laws changed to allow... Uh, private LRSs, there hadn't been a number already in place in the downtown. There were lots of applications. Now we have a number of purveyors in the downtown core. So it's about how do we, I think the motion that was put forward allows people to fairly come forward and say, I'm operating because there is this strange historic anomaly created because a federal uh, court system disagreed with a previous federal government, um, we've created this. We now have a number of operators in play. Do you want to run the first pass of post? Do you make the race available to the first person who gets an application in before a neighborhood meeting? I mean, there's a whole slew of other things that come out of this. So I think this just makes it an opportunity for everybody who's in play now not to have this rather fratricidal battle. I'm, I'm still supportive of it. Okay, thank you. May I call, oh yes, question from Councillor Alto and Councillor uh, Loveday. Uh, Councillor Coleman just made me think of a question for staff, and that is, uh, when would you anticipate stamping a completed application received? Is it after the Calic meeting, or is it when they put in their initial paperwork? 
I'll go to our director of planner, planning, Mr. Tinney. Uh, for our process for rezoning is that uh, an application can't be received until the CALIC meeting is held. Cannot be received. It cannot be received. Cannot. So, so in fact, including this particular or any any of the the regulations that we've hypothesized today, uh, that increases the burden on the Caluk resource community association resource. This by would, then they'll be in a position where they're going to need to respond to what I suspect are a variety, a number of quote urgent requests to hold a Caluk meeting. So whatever whatever regulations we include. We put in including this one just adds to that that burden. Uh, potentially, though, I think the, the details of how we uh, specifically suss these out and resource them, uh, both in terms of the CALIC process as well as internally, would be mm -hmm. part of what would staff would come back to council with, right. and that may include uh, how we uh, how we address some of the issues with the CALIC as well as right. uh, what those timings look like. Mm -hmm. Again, I think it's important for uh, council to understand that the 200 meter uh, buffer. Uh, while that uh, is a requirement within the policy, it is still within council's purview to, for whatever reason, to to override that in a subsequent application. If an application came forward uh, later, it is within council's purview mm -hmm. uh, to do that. And so this, it, it would be a guideline that we we're meant to go by. But in certain situations, uh, that could be uh, that could be overruled. Right. So an exemption could be applied for. And again, Jen, just to clarify, all of this that we've said today goes to staff and they're coming back then with a reiteration of what they think they've heard in the more regulatory framework. Is that correct? Yes. Mr. Coates? Yes, so there'd be um, <clears throat> sets of draft bylaws, so three anticipated, the zoning amendment bylaw for the, uh, the first piece, the business right. regulation bylaw, and the ticket bylaw that would accompany right. the business regulation bylaw. And at that time, we still have the capacity to amend. Through Mayor Helps, yes. Yes, thank you. Okay, Councillor Loveday, a question before I call the question on this amendment? What, so from the time that we pass the actual policy and say that they need rezonings, would there, what would be the time frame in which currently operating establishments have to apply? So through Mayor Helps, that would be uh, something that uh, the enforcement side of this um, will consider and so council will be asked to be, give consideration to that that overall approach because just for example the city of Vancouver is one year into their process and just recently have started acting on businesses that haven't brought themselves into compliance with their new regulations so that's one year later so that is a decision yet for council to make. Like, would it be possible, for example, to, this is just making this up on the fly, but just saying, uh, like, everyone has two months to apply. So rather than having a rush, you know all the applications are coming and you can consider them together rather than having a race. So we're considering on merit rather than Mr. Timeline. Tinney? Uh, certainly we can look at that. I think there would naturally be some sort of a, a phase in process as well as a process before uh, under which uh, would give some time for these applications to, uh, to, to go through the system before, com um, uh, before enforcement would apply. Obviously, you know, we wouldn't want to be enforcing things while things were still, uh, while your application was still being pending. And in terms of the timeline, in terms of uh, how that is approached, whether it's the first person who applies or the first person who, uh, you know, gets in front of council, that would have to be determined in terms of part of the, um, the process going forward. It, within the, the application in front of you are two separate uh, directions for staff on how to uh, process these applications. There is a recommendation. If that recommendation is, is supported here today, uh, we would come back with a resourcing plan that would also identify some of the more details about the process that we would see this going forward. And when do we expect this to come, if this is passed now, when would this come back in front of us? Through my help, so the, uh, the approach, the, our intent would be to come back in June with the bylaws. Okay, and um, one more question. So looking at the... The 200 meters, so 
if in in North Park, for example, we have there's there's lots within 200 meters of each other, and so um, we would still, if this policy was created, they can still all apply for rezonings. Um, it's just when it comes to us, it may not be recommended by staff because it's outside of the rezoning, outside of our policy. Mr. Tinney? That, that, that's correct. So we would not recommend it. That doesn't, pre, that, that, that doesn't uh, fetter council's uh, decision-making ability in terms of the actual rezoning. It just would not be in compliance with the policy. And, and how would we um, have an eye on what else is coming? So if there's one, just this is a hypothetical, but say there's one, it comes, and uh, maybe police have told us in camera that it, it's run by organized crime, but they've, they're, but they're operating, mean, this is all hypothetical, it hasn't happened, just for anyone who's listening. But if, if there was something like that, and then we knew there was another one coming, are we, that was within 200 meters, but it was, they've been a good neighbor, how would we uh, deal with that? How would we know that was coming so we could factor that in? Um, I am uh, reticent to answer sort of hypotheticals uh, of that sort, but again, totally I think, fair. Uh, I think ultimately uh, each application would come before council. Uh, recommendation would be made by staff based on its compliance with the policy. That said, if there was other information um, uh, that was germane to that uh, that discussion that council felt was important, then council could make uh, make some additional decisions based on that. Uh, you know, within within the uh, the, the boundary of, of rezoning processes, council has a, a, a wide latitude to consider a number of different considerations, um, not just what's in the policy. The policy is meant to guide council. Okay, Councillor Lucas indicated she wished to speak. Go ahead. In in making it fair for um, all of the businesses when they do the the they go to the Calugs. I guess maybe I'm making this up, but it, it just, things spurred as these questions come along. What happens if they came back and said, it's against the law, we don't want to do it? How, how fair would that be to other neighborhoods? Like, are they allowed to make that decision or are they only allowed on land and the building and they can't really say anything about what the business is inside? Just curious how the fairness could come into play here with all of the different neighborhoods. Mr. Tinney? Um, and the, I, I'm, I'm assuming what you mean is in, in reference to if a Calic refused to hold a meeting for, for whatever reason. Uh, right. Um, uh, certainly within, uh, within the bounds of the, 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 the Calic process, there is an opportunity for council to waive the Calic process um, if, if they so choose. Um, there's also provisions to, um, uh, yeah, I think that's the primary one. There's an opportunity for the, the council to waive that process in lieu of the public hearing, which would then come later uh, on the rezoning. If, if for whatever reason the Calic process was not something that was, uh, uh, that was, that was workable. That's great, thank you. Okay, uh, Councillor Thornton, Joe, and then Councillor Loveday, and again, I, I, on the 200 meter amendment. The, some of the questions triggered something that um, reminded me of our liquor um, policy. Does there not something that's not only just 200 meters, but something to do with village centers or not within neighborhoods? Uh, like not, because uh, I think we were trying to protect that they would be in main thoroughfares, not in residential. It, was that, is there something in there as well? If I can recall. Ms. Craig? Yes, there is something in, in the liquor retail store policy, and I can just sort of quote what we have proposed in the proposed rezoning here, which reflects that. So it says a storefront marijuana retailer should be in an established or planned retail location to minimize nuisance to nearby residential neighbors. This may be within a large urban village or town center, as identified in the OCP, within a commercial area identified in a neighborhood plan or in a location zoned for other retail use. So that it reflects what's uh, what you're referring to. Okay, thank you. Back to Councillor Loveday. Yeah, uh, another question for uh, Director Tinney. So, with the when a Calouk receives an application, do they have any? Is there any rules that guide um, them in terms of planning those Calouk meetings? Like, do they have the discretion to? 
I mean, they do their own agenda planning as far as I know. So they, if they received two applications, could they choose which one they wanted to deal with first and then therefore it would come to us first and be registered? Uh, <clears throat> through Mayor Helps, um, uh, there is a wide uh, array of r sort of um, different rules that the Calix uh, undertake the, themselves uh, through their processes. But I think, again, I think your, your question sort of presupposes that um, that the, that the uh, the establishment of, of, of whether or not you're first is whether or not you get your application in first. And that may not may be the approach we take. We may also take the approach that um, that it is the, at the time that the, the application is first in front of council. Uh, obviously, we see a number of applications sometimes that are submitted, and we have uh, follow-up questions that, that extend the process and take things longer. So w we would come back as part of our resourcing uh, plan with a bit of a... Um, uh, with a sketch out of how we would address some of the concerns that we've heard here tonight in terms of trying to make the process as fair as possible as well as uh, identifying opportunities to decrease the the impact on the calic you know the flip side to your question is also if the calic received two applications at the same time could they potentially uh, undertake uh, a meeting about both those applications at the same time, which would then decrease the resources on them? Uh, there's, a, there's a couple of different ways to, to, to look at this, and I think we would come back with some recommendations specifically on how we would do that. Thank you. And one more question. So uh, this is to maybe to Mayor Helps or maybe to uh, Councillor Young. So I'm, I'm looking for, I know we're voting on the 200 meter, but what are we actually amending? So. We're amending the direction to the, uh, the staff recommendations. So he, I guess it could have been more precise wording in the amendment that the 200 meter uh, from another storefront be removed from the regulations. Okay. Because so, the staff are proposing that we accept these uh, regulations and uh, in principle. And so that's, we're amending something that's not exactly on the table, but it's direction to staff. So too with the advertising. Okay. So I, I, I'm still torn on whether to support it, I guess is why I'm stalling. Uh, because <laughs> there's, there's uh, I want to stop there from being a race. And that's my main, my main concern. I don't think it should be first. Whoever gets here first gets to have it. And um, so because they're already operating, if we had no, nobody operating, that would make sense. But we, it's not the case. So we have people who are currently operating. So I think this is one way to do that, but I don't think it's the only way, and I'm not sure it's the best way. And so I'm sort of, I see both sides. And, okay, thank you. Yeah. This is one of those times where you might be asked to vote, and if you're not sure, then you'll have to do your, do your best in the moment, recognizing you'll get another crack at this when staff come back with the bylaw recommendations, as well as maybe some direction as to how to prevent a race. So with that, I'm gonna call the question, all those in favor of this amendment? One, two. Two in favor, those opposed, uh, six opposed. So the amendment fails. Councillor Young still has the floor on the main motion. And then I have uh, Lucas Helps and... Uh, try one more on the edibles. Um, that staff prepare amendments to the edible product regulations to address the health impacts identified in the communication from the provincial health officer and the intention... Is there a seconder? Okay, seconded by Councillor Lucas. So I've got and young Lucas, and then I've got something to say. And the, the intention would be that the other elements uh, could proceed, but this one would uh, might well require more um, consultation, uh, both with the provincial health officer and with um, uh, the um, public and the industry. But uh, I, I think the concerns are of sufficient weight that um, they need to be addressed. Thank you. I've got Councillor Lucas and then myself. Are we speaking on this? We're speaking on the amendment, yes. Thank you. I agree with Councillor Young. I think that uh, there are too many unknowns on the edibles, and I think that uh, the letter we received from our provincial health officer uh, clearly stated that um, there's been significant increases with... Um, uh, children getting their hands on on product. We don't know how much of the the drug is actually in them. There's no regulation, and I think that's 
that has to be looked at and uh, certainly a lot more um, has to be regulated. Thank you. Um, uh, for the same reasons that Councillor uh, Lucas is going to potentially vote for this amendment, I'm going to vote against it. I think um, what we need to do, we're, we're already doing the work of the federal government here. We've spent two hours now discussing this when we could be talking about the David Foster Harbour pathway, which is also another substantial agenda item. I am very loath to take on the work of the provincial government. And so I actually, I have a follow-up motion that Council direct the Mayor to write to, the, to Island Health requesting that Island Health in ensure food and health safety requirements are met for any edible products. That's not our job. It's clearly not our job. So that's, I, I, I you know, I, I understand the intention, but now we're going to, anyway, I've said enough, and after this whole thing has passed or not, as in we've dealt with this, I will you have that follow-up motion. Yes, Councillor Coleman. Just a question through to staff. Do we actually have any edible product regulations? All we've said is we're not going to go in that area. Through my help. So, no, the, the city isn't in a position to take on the provincial responsibility to regulate the, the, the manufacture or sale of, of food products. Um, so the issue here that staff brought forward was whether or not council wished to consider banning the sale of them, um, but the ability to enter into a regulatory regime is, to our understanding, one that doesn't exist currently. So my, my point is, we can't amend something that we don't actually have regulations in front of us for. Okay, thank you. I, I, Councillor Young, and then I'll call the question. Well, just quite, I mean, the whole, the whole endeavor is something where we arguably don't don't have authority so <laughs> i mean we're we're acting in a way to to fill a, a void um but i i guess um the regulations to which you referred may helps i guess my question is are they referring to um the cleanliness of the utensils that people use to cook this stuff up and whether there are rats in the kitchen and all that stuff, the sort of um, normal kind of food safe regulations, or do they go to the question of whether a child is likely to see a bunch of attractive looking candies, um, eat them and die, which is a different set of, of uh, standards. And I guess I'd like to know whether the uh, medical health, uh, the provincial health officer is going to be uh, addressing both of those under, under your request or just the one set of them? Uh, my intention is that it's both food safe and, you know, medical related. We, we don't regulate prescription drugs. We don't see what's in each and every pill. That's not our job. And so I think uh, we can word the, the letter. It, my intention is both. I th I'm not sure if the motion that I proposed covers both adequately, but I mean food safe and uh, medical content because that's something that's, that's Island Health's responsibility or the federal, someone's responsibility. It's not ours to say what can be in the brownies that are sold in retail uh, outlets in our city. So, okay. Uh, I will then call the question on the amendment. All those in favor? Okay. Those opposed? Two in favor, six opposed. The amendment fails. Um, Councillor Young, any further uh, amendments? Okay, so back to the uh, main motion. I have myself and, uh, sorry, Councillor Lucas and then myself next, and then Councillor Loveday. Thank you. Um, thank you to the staff. This is a, a, a very well laid out report, and it, it, um, although it's a very challenging issue, it did help to clarify so many things. Um, we're going to have challenges uh, moving forward. Um, I think they've all been outlined here by um, different councillors and the mayor. Um, I'm just hoping that uh, the, the feds come down with the uh, regulations in spring of 2017. I've heard lots of different varying degrees of this uh, I, because I think they've realized the complications around it as well. Um, I... I still have concerns about our, our the ability for police, the position that we may be putting them in. Um, I, I don't know the answer to that. I don't think any of us do. I, it, it's difficult because, as was stated, our judicial system doesn't want to deal with it, so it puts, again, the police in a difficult place where, for them, it is illegal. So 
Um, I see some of the issues around the rezoning with the neighborhoods, the race to get there. Um, and uh, to me, the 200 meters, seeing what happened in the downtown core with the liquor stores, with so many of us um, on every block, um, it was a real test, and it still is today, for resources for um, uh, our police. So, um, but I, 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 I'm certainly going to move forward on this. I'd like to see an amendment to the edibles. Um, I think that's still very important that we're very careful with that. So, uh, but overall, I think um, this is uh, supportable. Thank you. Um, I support this. Uh, I do have a few questions that arose from uh, questions that colleagues asked in the first round. Um, Mr. Coates, can we charge an application fee that reflects the cost of all of the work that will go into the one-time application and then also charge a business license fee on an ongoing basis? Just for clarification, Mayor Helps, the first question is specific to the rezoning application? Correct. And, and, and to, that, this, that this rezoning application um, may entail more or different work than other rezoning applications. So, Through you then, um, so the, the intent is as part of the business case to bring with that on the planning side appropriate fees to, uh, to attach to these types of applications? Perfect. So there'll, there'll be a one-time application fee and then an ongoing business license fee. Yes, Mr. Johnson? The intention behind any uh, proposed fees would be full cost recovery Perfect. for the applications. Okay. Thank you. That's all I'm getting at. Um, yeah, thank you. I, I think that's, that's all. Um, Actually, Your Worship, in your discussion of my amendment, you mentioned you were going to be proposing an amendment and that is germane to my um, uh, issue of whether to support this or not. If, if, if I can be persuaded that your amendment with regard to um, the provincial health officer and the edibles. Thank um, you. Councillor Young, what I actually said is that I was going to propose this as a subsequent motion because directing the mayor to write to Island Health is not doesn't fit in in my, I would rule it out of order as an amendment if it were made by someone else. So presumably I read it out so people would know, but directing me to write to the island, a medical officer is not an amendment to this motion. It's a separate motion. Well, it's, it's germane in the sense okay, that it, you. it then, was a, it was a substitute for my motion, which failed. And I wonder if we could uh, get some comment from the staff. Have, have they had an opportunity to consider this and whether uh, this is, is going to be successful? So I'm going to move that we postpone consideration of the motion on the table so that we can address the other motion to give Councillor Young comfort. Is there a seconder for postponement? Thank you. All those in favour? Any opposed? Okay, thank you. That matter has been postponed. I have a new motion, uh, separate but related to the postponed motion, uh, that Council direct the Mayor to write to the Chief Medical Officer uh, requesting that Island Health ensure food safe requirements and any medical considerations are met for the sale of edible products. Second. Okay, thank you. Discussion? Councillor Young. Well, I'll, I'll support that, and, and um, I, that will allow me to um, provisionally support the main, the other motion, the postponed motion as well, um, at least pending some response with regard to that because certainly I, I, I like you would prefer that the provincial authorities um, address address the issue and make the regulations rather than us I certainly agree with that okay thank you Councillor Young or Councillor Coleman can you just say what you said into my ear because I was listening Sorry. to him and you at the same as, time and I can't as do that this is a separate notion motion it actually has to say edible marijuana products okay thank you <laughs> And, and I'm sorry, I can't send motions and do everything at the same time. So it's, what I said was uh, food safe requirements and medical concerns. And thanks to staff for keeping up. Okay, further discussion? All those in favor of that separate motion? Any opposed? Okay, thank you. I will now move that we lift the previous motion uh, from the table. Thank you, all those in favor? Any opposed? Thank you. 
Uh, I was speaking. Um, Councillor Young had a point of order that he needed to raise, ish. Uh, that's been raised. Uh, I have Councillor Loveday next, who hasn't yet spoken on the main motion, and then I will uh, suggest after Councillor Loveday speaks that we do call the question on this, uh, the main motion as it's been amended. Councillor Loveday. Yeah, I'd like to staff, uh, thank staff for the thorough report and the great work. I do think it's pretty clear. Um, <clears throat> I'm of the mind that we need to move forward with with regulating dispensaries. I, I'm disappointed that we still don't have any information from the federal government that allows us to move forward in a way that we, we really know what we're working with. And so I do have a, I will draft something up that'll be a subsequent motion to write to the federal government again. And because um, it's really unfortunate that we're, that we've been brought to this point because of a vacuum of leadership for the federal government. Now we have a new federal government who seems to be taking leadership, but we're not hearing, receiving the information we need to receive in order to, I, I think, make these decisions in a way that we know that we're doing so with with all of the information that's available to us. I, I'm sure there's someone who, know, someone who knows what's going to happen, and we're not uh, in terms of federal regulation, and, and they haven't shared that information with us. So I, I, I'm, I'm supportive of this. I'm glad to see the, um, the changes in terms of edible marijuana products being um, allowed. Be, I know that there's a lot of people who are... Uh, you know, the, the regulations in terms of edible, edible marijuana products and also the, the delivery by mail, I think it, by not allowing those, it actually harms the people who may need the products the most. And, and that's, there's a lot of people who, who take marijuana for their, for their pain and whatnot, but they, because of health reasons, they don't want to smoke it. And so I think this, um, this will help them. And same with people who aren't able to leave the house to, to get their, um, their medications. So I'm supportive of both of those changes. I, as I indicated, I'm, I'm iffy on the 200 meters because I, I am very concerned about the idea of a race. And I think that we should be making these decisions based on merit and based on how these businesses that do have track records, because they have been open, they have been uh, either integrating well or not with their neighborhoods and either been a good neighbor or not. And so I think we do have information. It's not as uh, well tracked as it could have been if they had applied for business license, if they had licenses all, all the time. But, uh, you know, the people who live in those neighborhoods and who operate businesses next to them and their landlords as well, and in some cases, um, can provide that information. I think that will come out in public hearings. And I and I just don't want a, that just to be a race. I want it to be based on on how on merit. So, um, looking at that, I mean, all in all, I, I'm I, I'm very uh, able to support it. I, I you saw me my brain working doing the math backwards from spring 2017, and I'm hoping that uh, I'm hoping one we hear from the federal government quickly. And so we know what we're working with, and we know that whether or not uh, these, this model for regulating dispensaries will, in effect, uh, be useful after 2017, because it very well could be. And so if we're going in the wrong direction completely, I hope they tell us soon. Thank you. With that, um, yes, Councillor thornton Joe. Um, I don't think we have an amendment yet regarding daycare or school grounds. I thought Councillor Madoff may have was thinking of it, but um, I just wanted to reinforce that I think maybe we need to consider. I just uh, I sent an email to all of you that we received from an agency who gets funded for uh, childcare facilities, and they're concerned about uh, losing their funding uh, because they have a uh, dispensary as well as. Uh, um, a lounge nearby and so you know I think if that's the case if we're if we're finding that people may be losing their funding for for issues like child care or that's something that's going to be uh, negatively affecting our neighborhood so um, I'll, maybe I'll test a motion though then to add um, uh, 
daycare and I'm going to add at daycare if anyone wants to add any. How amendments. about licensed child care facilities? Sure, sure. Licensed child care facilities. Okay. Moved and seconded. Discussion? Okay. All those in favor? Any opposed? Okay. Thank, thank you. you. Okay. I've already said all my pros. Uh, no, I'm, I'm, I am going to add, though, that I appreciate um, the amendment regarding uh, the edibles. I'm torn because I am concerned about uh, that is not whether it's properly packaged and labeled. Uh, but I also recognize that uh, a large percentage of people that use edibles are, are women and seniors. And and I've been amazed by the amount of uh, individuals that I know, whether they're relatives or non-relatives, that have approached me and, and said that how edibles have assisted them. So I, I do understand the concern, but I do see that, that this may be an opportunity for another level of government to uh, regulate that or put something in place to assist. Okay. Thank you. All right, and seeing no further speakers, I will call the question. All those in favor? Any opposed? Okay, thank you very much. Council will take a half.